I really appreciate your joining us uh, for this webinar. And we're going to talk about uh, Master of Arts in Bioethics and Medical Humanities um, in general, and also features specific to our program. Um, if it's of interest to you or to folks that you might know, share the information. And of course, you know, we'll have plenty of time to, to take questions um, and try to address uh, whatever your uh, interests are, okay? So we can get started now. I'm gonna move us forward. And Leah, why don't you introduce yourself and, and give sure. Well, welcome everyone to our webinar about our master's program in bioethics and medical humanities at Case Western Reserve University. Um, we're so thankful that you took the time out of your day to um, spend an hour with us and just learn about our program. Um, as Dr. Alicia said, I'm uh, Dr. Leah Jeanette. I'm a senior research associate in our department and I'm also a graduate of the master's program. Um, so I'm gonna just help moderate a little bit today I will be monitoring the Q&A uh, feature on Zoom. So if you have questions during the presentation, feel free to submit through the Q&A and we can either answer in the chat or in the Q&A or we can answer it live as well. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about Case Western Reserve University um, as a whole and then we'll go into talking about the program overview, program outcomes, talk a little bit about student life student assistantships and financial aid and the application process and deadlines. Very good, thank you. I'm gonna apologize in advance. You're gonna hear a lawnmower in the back. The neighbor is uh, cutting her grass and um, I had the window shut, but it's still pretty loud. Now I have an electric lawnmower and it's really quiet, but you know, she's got the old gas, um, which is belching uh, CO2 into the atmosphere. Okay. This is me, Mark Alicio. I'm the Susan E. Watson uh, Professor and Chair of Bioethics, and I direct, and that's Case Western, of course, and I direct a Center for Biomedical Ethics at Metro Health, uh, which is one of our affiliate medical centers. So my background is really um, analytic philosophy, uh, but when, and moral and political and applied. Um, but when you, you know, when, in a bioethics um, frame, it's really clinical bioethics. I've been doing clinical bioethics for about 25 years, actually a little over. Um, and most of my publishing and research and teaching and, and other outreach is, is clinical bioethics. So I've been very fortunate. I've been at Case Western since 2000. I came here from the University of Pittsburgh uh, where I was doing clinical ethics um, uh, as well. And for me, it was coming home because I grew up in Northeast Ohio. Uh, so it was really nice. For my first 15 years here, um, in addition to uh, being part of the department at Case and faculty, uh, including running the MA program, running the PhD program at, at different times, um, I also headed up, um, my primary responsibility was heading up the Center for Biomedical Ethics at Metro where I chaired the ethics committee, uh, did ethics consultation. I still do ethics consultation at Metro. A lot of education and training for health professionals, of course, in and around uh, clinical ethics issues, sat on the IRB and did lots of other uh, interesting things. Metro is kind of the region's safety net. It's the, cow uh, the county hospital of Cuyahoga County. And Really, if you like clinical bioethics, it's one of the most interesting places to be engaged because the kinds of cases we would see uh, with a level one trauma center, um, one of the busiest life flights in the country, um, a burn unit that was among the first established nationally and, and sees some really um, uh, difficult and compelling cases. Um, so Metro is a really interesting place to do clinical bioethics. Um, anyway, Case. Case Western is, this is a couple pictures of the campus. The, the lower picture is um, the front of the medical school and the biomedical research building. Um, and now we have a health education campus, which is uh, a health education 
campus, which is over uh, on the campus of the Cleveland Clinic, not far away, it's walkable, but this is, is the, still the official uh, administrative location for the medical school and the biomedical research building and, and our program is here. Um, and then you see a, an overhead shot of the campus there. Uh, Case is really an outstanding national research university. So even if you just use US News, you see, you know, we've got the ninth rank social work program, which we have a dual degree with, by the way, uh, healthcare law, uh, any given year, it'll be one, two, three, so seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, one of the top nursing programs in the country, acute care nurse practitioning, uh, was developed here at Case Western uh, with a bioethics person involved and and a real pioneer, uh, Barbara Daly, um, who's also a doctorate in philosophy, by the way, uh, now is retired, but but an amazing uh, academic and an amazing practitioner. Um, we have a outstanding uh, master's level nursing program at Case, a strong MBA, and technically the U.S. News has its 25th for med school research. Um, depending on what ranking you look at, we are as high as 16. Um, a lot of ex excellent programs here. Um, I'm going to skip back here and say something about us in bioethics. I don't think you could find anybody who would say that we're not one of the top programs in bioethics and medical humanities. Um, and as you saw on our initial screen, uh, we're coming into our 25th anniversary year of the MA program. So we're one of the oldest and, and best established, and I'm confident to say most well-regarded um, in the country in our area. Um, so why bioethics and medical humanities? Um, well, as we're all sitting at home uh, dealing with uh, COVID-19, I think it's become pretty evident to even those who aren't paying a lot of attention um, that there are ethical issues that run all through biomedicine uh, and the life sciences. And really what bioethics and medical humanities aim to do is to tease apart these difficult value-laden questions by approaching them or complex issues, um, complex phenomena, by approaching them um, with and looking at them through different lenses. Um, so it can be the lenses of bioethics, it can be the lenses of, of philosophy, history, uh, any one of the social sciences. Um, and what we think is that if you want to really sort through a complex value-laden um, practice uh, or uh, question, uh, issue, constellation of issues, you're going to need a bunch of different lenses and you're going to need a lot of folks working hard to sort through the issues and then you can start to move forward. So, you know, it's hard to find an area in and around uh, biomedicine, the practice and delivery of healthcare, the life sciences that isn't touched by bioethics and medical humanities. And I'd argue actually that you can't find such an area because the value-laden nature of these endeavors uh, makes bioethics and medical humanities relevant, whether folks realize it or not. So on a practical level, the healthcare industry touches us all. Um, we do have ongoing advancements in science and technology that inevitably raise ethical concerns. Uh, if you think about, you know, the emergence of, of what we used to call respirators, but we now call ventilators in, in the mid-70s, and the concerns that raised about life-sustaining treatment, withholding and withdrawing life-sustaining treatment, the possibility of indefinitely uh, keeping someone alive who didn't otherwise seem alive, right? The notion of brain death, uh, questions in organ donation and transplant. Um, they, they, these issues emerge over and over. Right now, we're looking at questions in research ethics, sort of speeding along a uh, vaccine for COVID um, and maybe cutting some corners, but how much additional risk are we injecting into uh, well, the pun is intended, I think, um, and appropriate into the vaccine endeavor. Uh, these are really 
important and interesting questions. What's the trade-off between, for example, stay-at-home orders um, and the, the flattening of the curve and the mitigation strategies that are aimed at saving lives? Uh, there's, there's an economic trade-off. There are other types of trade-offs. Uh, what kinds of values should inform policy and practice um, if we, technological imperative, if we can do something, does that mean we should do it? Um, we have operated sometimes as a society uh, as if we're driven by the technological imperative. We plow ahead sometimes before we think about uh, the really, um, potentially really significant issues and downstream consequences. Um, can we ensure justice and respect for persons uh, that they are uh, present in our research, in our clinical practice? These are the kinds of questions uh, and many others, of course, that you'll see in and around bioethics and medical humanities. Okay, so if you're thinking about a career in, um, clinical, in a clinical area in law um, that, that you think um, you might want to supplement with uh, or have it carve out a niche um, uh, with respect to bioethics and medical humanities, um, then, then this is a good program for you. Um, we've had lots of folks come through, students come through our program who've gone on to you know, nursing, medicine, uh, on to become physician's assistants, anesthesiology assistants, uh, DOs, um, you name it. We've had plenty of students do our program who end up going to law school. Um, we've had, of course, we have the dual degree with social work. Um, so if you think about um, bioethics and medical humanities as somehow supplementing or augmenting or giving you a niche area, um, as you move on to uh, another professional area. That's one way to think about it. Another way to think about bioethics and medical humanities is, is not so much as a companion that helps you carve out a niche and give you a certain kind of identity, uh, but actually as what will be the focus of your future work. And we certainly have plenty of folks who've gone on um, to work in the regulatory apparatus, so IRBs, um, gone on to pursue um, uh, PhDs in the arts and humanities. Uh, folks like me who've, who've uh, gone on and had a foot in the clinical and academic world. Um, and one of the things our program has been, I think, really good for is if you're not quite sure right now, um, or you think you want to improve your academic credentials, um, but also sort out what your trajectory is going to be, uh, this is a really good program to do because it's not a wasted year. Uh, it will not be. And whatever step you take going forward from this point um, will be impacted by and enhanced by um, your time in our program. And I would say it's generally true for bioethics and medical humanities programs. But of course, the one I know best is the one I can speak to best, which is ours. This is the 25th anniversary of our program. So we have here, uh, at least on the right of my screen, I hope on the right of yours, what is it we're only allowed to call a visual asset. Uh, we wanted to call it a logo for our 25th, but it's a visual asset celebrating our 25th year. So you will be, if you come here and you're part of this class, part of a very special class for us. Um, our program is a one-year program if you go full-time. Uh, two full semesters, fall, spring, 30 credit hours, um, and we have 13.5 hours of elective. So um, the, the required hours, um, the, the other 16.5, um, are made up of two six credit hour core seminars, bioethics foundations and bioethics and medical humanities one foundations bioethics medical humanities two beth 401 beth 402 um, those are year long so each is a semester long but the two combined is year long um, and they meet on tuesdays and thursdays two and a half hours at a time six credits each uh, so you end up with 12 for the year 
uh, and they're really, it's, it's really, uh, um, as the name suggests, foundations and bioethics, foundations and medical humanities. So we do things like approaches to bioethics uh, and medical humanities, um, reproductive ethics, pediatric ethics, um, questions in adolescent uh, ethics, end of life decision making. Um, uh, then in the second semester, we get into things like um, public health and bioethics, uh, justice questions and bioethics. The past couple of years, we've had a unit on neuroethics uh, and bioethics. So uh, research ethics is also one of the, the units. So we, we have four to five units each semester. You're given a, a, an assessment for that unit. Uh, there's a unit of coordinator. Um, the, the year is structured around faculty teaching their specialties. So, so each of these seminars are uh, core seminars, foundations, bioethics one and two are, are team taught. Um, we also have our clinical rotations, which we'll talk a little bit more about, but in a nutshell, um, 80 hours of clinical observation um, in uh, ideally in a public hospital setting uh, for one and a private hospital setting for the other. Um, with uh, hospice experience and a palliative care experience as we are able um, to make those available. Um, and those rotations in some fashion um, are part of your required, um, uh, your core requirements. Um, and then we have a whole array of electives from um, oh, ethics and genetics, clinical ethics theory and practice, uh, bioethics and public health, um, uh, narrative medicine, just to name a few uh, that you would pick from to fill out your elective uh, opportunities. Um, among those electives, we have short-term study abroad opportunities, which we'll look at a little uh, in a few minutes, a little more in a few minutes. Uh, we do uh, personalized advising. We do offer student assist assistantships. Uh, generally, these are in exchange for a, poor, a partial tuition waiver. Um, so they're not full assistantships, uh, but they are partial. And what you do um, is work with a faculty person on research or help as a teaching assistant or what have you, uh, a handful of hours a week, depending on the, the extent of the assistantship, um, in order to um, carry out your responsibilities that you do in exchange for the assistantship. Uh, we have what you might call the traditional bioethics concentration. Um, I, it, it really, the default concentration is a bioethics con concentration, and it's the program that's been around since 95. Um, but in addition to that, if you want to focus uh, instead on a, a sort of different concentration area, you could do medicine, society, and culture, which is really our kind of medical humanity, social medicine concentration. Or you could do research ethics, which is obviously a research ethics concentration that's orientated toward folks with interest in research ethics and who might have a trajectory uh, either as going on in research themselves, so they want to be um, you know, really uh, competent in re research ethics, or, or actually um, uh, orientated toward a career in uh, research ethics and regulation, so IRB work, compliance, etc. Um, the concentrations, the way they work, is you end up having one of your electives is actually required um, as a core course, a foundational course uh, in the area. So for medicine, society, and culture here, um, you would have the foundations in medicine, society, and culture, which is a three credit hour. We actually have a typo on here, but there's a three credit hour course seminar. There you would have a tailored clinical rotation or a, a different practicum um, that fit medicine, society, and culture. So we've had students go to different settings that uh, say outpatient settings or community medicine settings. Uh, free clinic, right? Something that's a little, it's, it's not the acute care hospital setting and it's tailored specifically to those with the medicine, society, and culture. So bioethics, medical humanity, sorry, medical humanity, social medicine kind of interest. Um, and then you select your other electives 
based on their relevance to medicine, society, and culture. So they're really drawing from the medical humanities, social medicine electives that are offered either internal to our department or across the university. Um, research ethics core overview course, which is really kind of a foundations in research ethics. Um, you'd select your electives uh, as research ethics relevant uh, with your advisor. Um, so you tailor um, your practicum. You would, in place of one of your clinical ethics rotations, you would do a practicum which might place you in an IRB or an Office of Human Subjects Research Protection uh, or with an IACUC, uh, 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 Institutional um, Animal Review Committee. Um, and you would also participate in an ongoing journal club. Um, so you see how you can develop a concentration uh, focused in a particular area like medicine, society, and culture, research ethics, if you want to, uh, or you can stay with kind of the bioethics default. So what I'm calling the bioethics concentration of the, of the traditional program. This gives you a structure of what your semester might look like. And here you see for the traditional concentration, bioethics concentration, you've got more latitude with your electives, but you're gonna be selecting them with a bioethics focus medicine, society, and culture, you have this foundations of medicine, society, and culture, which is a required course seminar if you're one of the people who's concentrating in that area. And then you select your electives according to uh, MSC relevance, uh, of course, with guidance from your advisor. And then the MSC seminar is actually a um, uh, cross-university uh, lecture seminar that is similar to the Research Ethics Journal Club, and you take advantage of that. Um, research ethics, structurally the same as, as MSC, um, but with a research ethics focus. Second semester, ditto. One thing to note, though, what do you see on here, second semester, that's different? Uh, well, a couple things, depending on whether it's the bioethics concentration, medicine, society, and culture, or research ethics, but where you see across the board that's different is your capstone. And what you do with your capstone is you identify a topic area, a reader from among the faculty, and you work over the course of the, your second semester to write a 22 to 25 page research paper um, on, a, on an, a topic of mutual interest between you and your reader that ideally will kind of take a stand um, on an issue of importance in bioethics, medical humanities, or social medicine. Um, that's a lot of fun and it's a lot of work, but it's, well, it's our capstone. That's why we call it that. All right. Clinical rotations. Um, we have opportunities at the Cleveland Clinic, which probably you've heard of, uh, almost no matter where you, I go, people know the Cleveland Clinic, um, world renowned for clinical innovation and clinical care. Uh, and they're one of our four um, uh, academic medical affiliates, the Lewis B. Stokes Veterans uh, Administration Hospital. Um, these, these are very close to campus, by the way, the Lewis B. Stokes is pretty much on campus. It's here in University Circle. Um, the Cleveland Clinic is just adjacent. Um, Lewis B. Stokes is a veterans hospital, public hospital, uh, different orientation, different mission than the clinic, uh, different culture for sure, but some incredibly interesting work going on there. By the way, um, there's a, I think you can get on Netflix, I Am Human. Um, which is a really interesting documentary on sort of the human machine interface and functional electrical stimulation and neuroethics. Uh, one of the key patients, one of the patients that is followed in that uh, Netflix documentary uh, was a Lewis B. Stokes patient, and it was our biomedical engineering people at Case um, who did the, the work to help this patient uh, eventually be able to move his arms again is really interesting. Uh, you, you should watch it if you can. 
Uh, anyway, Lewis B. Stokes uh, VA rotations we have there. Uh, Metro Health System, which is, as I mentioned, the County Hospital of Cuyahoga County, the Region Safety Net, um, really interesting history, research tradition, educational tradition, um, and University Hospitals of Cleveland, which is also right you know, on the Case campus um, and a long time uh, relationship with, between all these institutions and the School of Medicine. Uh, I think the oldest relationship between the School of Medicine and its academic teaching hospitals is with UH um, and Metro Health, going way back to the early 1900s. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So what do you do? You'll round in an ICUs. You'll get a hospice, a palliative care experience, ideally. Um, You'll come to experience some of the challenges in skilled nursing, psychiatry, general medicine, emergency medicine, so on. Um, depending on the institution and the availability of different professionals, you might be able to hang out with a chaplain for a day or a social worker, observe some genetic counseling, um, live donor advocacy, um, music therapy. Uh, become familiar with the work of ombudspeople, um, uh, ombudsmen in clinical settings. They're basically responding to complaints uh, from that are usually patient uh, or family initiated. Um, we'll also have, we also have an expectation that you'll attend uh, at least one ethics committee meeting, at least one IRB meeting, um, and then some other uh, area specific, institution specific meetings depending on um, the unique um, strengths and opportunities at the affiliate in question. We do have a large array of study abroad courses. They all had to be canceled this year. It's very sad, um, but we hope we're running them again next spring. Um, so we have a course in Costa Rica um, that's comparative health systems. Um, comparing the U.S. and Costa Rican health system. You know, one of the interesting things about the Costa Rican system is very public health focused. And as you've seen in uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, our public health infrastructure in the United States is not what it should be. Um, and unfortunately, we, we tore down some of what we had um, rather unwisely and an at an untimely, uh, unfortunate time. Um, we have a course in the Netherlands on women's health, public health, drugs, and detention. So uh, looking at Dutch approaches to these very uh, serious and broad public health issues uh, like, you know, uh, the war on drugs. They don't have a war on drugs, right? They have a legalization and control program. Um, how incarceration is looked at in the two countries and what the ethical issues are there. Uh, public health questions concerning women and prostitution and obviously very different um, approaches uh, there as well. Uh, so a lot to be learned. And by the way, these courses, we do some prep here on campus with two, three sessions ahead of time. But when you go, whether it's over the winter break, whether it's over the spring break or it's two weeks in May, um, you are taught by collaborative faculty at the institutions that we, we uh, build a relationship with. So it's, it's, you get Dutch faculty, you get Costa Rican faculty, you get French faculty, you get Spanish faculty. Uh, at Yellowstone, you get naturalists. Um, uh, although that course right now, we're not sure where that's gonna end up. Of course, that's true for all of them. Um, but as you may or may not know, the national parks have been hit very hard during this um, uh, pandemic and the Yellowstone Forever Foundation, which provided the naturalists that helped us teach, um, is itself trying to find its footing and, and really get back on its feet. But anyway, these are some of the opportunities and they're amazing. And we have some great faculty we collaborate with. We're lucky, we built this. Well, we've been building this since 2004, so. Okay, um, we have multiple dual degrees. JDMA, MDMA, MPHMA, Master in Genetic Counseling, MA, Nursing, MA, um, Master's of Social Science Administration, MA, that's our social work MA here at um, 
or social work, the equivalent of an MSW for, for broader concerns. Uh, and uh, on the books, only been done a couple times with a PhD in genetics and an MA. Those are our dual degrees. If you want to try for a dual degree, you need to apply to each program separately, get acceptance in each program separately, indicate that you're interested in the dual degree to each program as you apply, and then a decision is made after you're admitted to the both programs. Okay? All right. Where have our students gone on to? Here's a long list. Pretty cool. We have students at NIH. We have students who've gone on to the AMA. We've had folks end up working in uh, biopharma, um, bio, other areas of you know, medical device, um, but we're proud of this. And um, we, this is one of our, uh, well, it's one of the things we're most proud of because we like to, to follow uh, what our students go on to do and we love to see their successes. Um, student life and university circle. Leah, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so university circle is the uh, neighborhood that case is technically located in. Um, it includes the area hospitals and there's even some other universities there, but um, there's lots of apartments and um, fun things to do. Um, students uh, within our program love to um, do activities together. I think what's really neat is that our students come from all different backgrounds, educational experiences, majors, all those kind of things. And then they come together for this really intense nine month program. And then they go out their separate ways. But during those nine months, they really bond and spend time together. Um, some of these photos just illustrate that we've done um, picnics, we've gone to conferences together, sporting events, um, they've done paint nights, they've done um, soccer games and all kinds of fun stuff. So our students really um, are able to bond um, during their time in our program. So we have, just to give you an idea, um, two years ago, we had 23 different countries of birth represented among our student population. Um, our program draws from not just across the United States, but, but from other countries as well. And um, it's, it's a really interesting thing to see folks from, with different academic backgrounds, with different cultural backgrounds, of course, different life experiences come together and be part, become part of a, a cohesive group here uh, at Case Western and University Circle. One of the things that helps with that is that University Circle itself is one of the most culturally rich uh, and culturally dense um, areas in the country. So Peter B. Lewis, who founded Progressive Insurance and is a billionaire, he's now deceased, he died a few years ago. Um, one of the things he was most known for was he was the only person funding the move to legalize marijuana, the movement to legalize marijuana for years and years and years. He died before he got to see the success of this funding. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Peter B. Lewis wanted University Circle to be recognized and pulled together as one of the most cultur culturally rich areas in the world, not just in the country. And it is. So you have the top freestanding art museum in the Cleveland Museum of Art. You have the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. You have the Botanical Gardens. You have the Cleveland Orchestra, which has been for years named by Time Magazine as the best band in the land and for many years has been top one, two, or three internationally for orchestras. Um, you have the uh, amazing richness of, well, you have the aesthetic beauty of, of Severance Hall, where the orchestra plays. Um, we have the Museum of Contemporary Art, or the MOCA building, which is this fascinating, sort of glassy, reflective building, uh, really interesting architecture. But, but University Circle is a good place to be. And right now, although COVID has changed everything for everybody, Cleveland has, is having a really nice renaissance. 
um, Playhouse Square in Cleveland, which is down Euclid Avenue um, in downtown Cleveland, is the largest performing arts uh, venue outside of Broadway in, in the nation. Um, and we get, you know, first run here. Uh, we get really high quality um, performances and plays. Of course, for the foreseeable future, that's not going to be going on, but, um, but it'll come back. Um, we have a good food scene. Um, we have the Rock Hall downtown. And it's strange, and you wouldn't think of this, but Cleveland has a very robust metro park system. Um, that's tied to the old conservationist environmentalist movement during the days of Teddy Roosevelt. And per capita, Cleveland has more park space, the region has more park space per capita than any major metropolitan area in the country, which is really unintuitive, I know, given Cleveland's reputation, but it's a fact. We also have West Side Market, which is considered one of the 20 most interesting places to shop for food in the country because it represents something like 80 different ethnicities with shops and, and types of food. Um, it's, this is a good place to be. It's also affordable. So if you're thinking about that, the cost of housing, uh, the cost of living, um, Cleveland's a very good place to be. Leah, you want to talk about financial aid? Sure. So, um, of course, being that we are um, a you know, university in the United States, we um, have a financial aid office and students will be required to fill out FAFSA for that. And there's traditional financial aid options, including grants and loans and scholarships. The financial aid office um, is fantastic at um, helping students with that. But um, as was mentioned earlier, we also have something called student assistantships. And these are ways for students to get involved in assisting with teaching, research, administrative opportunities, and in exchange, you get partial tuition waivers. Um, students can earn or receive a tuition waiver up to $12,000. Um, the average is around $5,000. Um, so there are limited number of these. Um, the deadline for that is June 1st. Um, so if you're interested in applying to the program, um, you can also apply for these student assistantships simultaneously. And um, so you, we'll send out that link to everyone um, after the webinar. So um, if you want more specific details on tuition numbers, you can also go to um, Graduate Studies website. So the application process itself, here's some information on that. And um, this will remain available, right, Leah? Yes, the, the application process um, hasn't changed much. Um, the one, two things we have changed recently. One is we have made um, test scores optional this year because we know a lot of cancellation has yeah. taken place for right. GREs and MCATs and those things. And so right. we decided to make them optional. And we've also waived the application fee for the remainder of the fall 2020 cycle. So when you go to apply, you won't have to pay the, the application fee. So the, the, we do have a few, let's see if we get, we've got a few questions in the chat box. I think we can. I can read you the question if you want. So yeah, okay, um, go ahead. the first question is, how is a student's learning assessed throughout the degree? Uh, okay, generally it's done through, it depends on the course. So there are some courses where uh, the bulk of the learning would be assessed based on your participation in class, your written and, and oral other contributions, verbal contributions, uh, but also an, an end of the uh, semester, end of the course paper. Um, others, like the foundations, um, uh, bioethics, foundations and bioethics, medical humanities one, and foundations and bioethics, medical humanities two, the course seminar, you'll have a unit assignment and it might be a short paper. It might be um, an exercise. It might be a small group exercise, uh, but there's a variety of assessments there. Our program does tend to be fairly writing intensive. Um, so that can be a little bit of a step, uh, a stretch for some who aren't used to writing, uh, but it's not as writing intensive as it used to be. 
And what we are trying to do is to incorporate different types of assessments so that it doesn't skew too much toward uh, one learning style and one expression of understanding. I'll add too that CASE has a wonderful writing center that students who um, would like some assistance in their writing can schedule appointments with them, whether it's specifically about an assignment or about their capstone or something they're trying to publish even. So question, looks like there's also a question about um, whether we know when we're gonna open or not uh, in the fall. So here's what we've, Justin, uh, this is all I can tell you, okay? Um, you'll know as much as I know um, in, in, in about five seconds. We've been told we need to deliver in-person and virtual, so dual delivery for every class. So the expectation is that there will be in-person classes in the fall, but we also anticipate some students, for example, who are coming from abroad, might not be able to get on campus in time for the start of the semester. Of course, that can all change because, yeah, I mean, you see things are going on all over. University of Notre Dame is welcoming students back August 10th. Um, University of South Carolina is doing a similar thing. Will they hold to that? Don't know. But, but uh, we're prepared to do dual delivery, uh, virtual and in person, and we hope that we, it's gonna be as, as close to normal as possible. There's, MCAT. Go ahead. Sorry, Leah. That's okay. I was just going to say there's also a question about the MCAT. Um, generally, test scores should be taken within the last three years. Um, if you took the MCAT and it's longer um, or it's been longer than three years, you don't have to submit the test score to us. We don't, we don't require it for the application. Um, we also do not have minimum test scores or minimum GPAs that we require for the application process. When we look at an application, we're really looking at the student's whole entire package. We know that there are some students that might be applying to our program that have come from a very strong STEM background. And you know what, maybe you struggled with organic chemistry and, or maybe you struggled with physics. And those courses, you didn't get the grade you wanted. And um, because of that, your GPA isn't as high as you want it to be. But if we look at your specific transcript, we might see that you did really well in some of your general education courses, your humanities courses. Maybe you even took a bioethics course and you got an A in that or a medical humanities course. So we look at the application overall. And that's also why part of our process involves an interview is we want to understand the student's specific situation or the applicant's specific situation, um, your application, your resume, all of that. Uh, there's another question. When does the application open for next year's cycle for starting in 2021? Generally, the application opens sometime in mid-September. And we do rolling admissions. So we try not to make you wait too long to get an answer from us. One of the things we do want though is just to underscore what Dr. Jeanette said, we want a personal statement from you and we wanna make sure that the program's a good fit for you and you're a good fit for the program because in the end, what do we wanna do? We, we want you to be um, successful here. And we want you, this program, to help you find your way, whether it's toward a professional program, on your way to a PhD, into the workforce. Yes, Malika, you can apply. We do have, we don't emphasize this, um, but we do have a number of profession, people who are at different stages of their career. Some are looking to transition for after a long a career in healthcare. Um, others are mid-career and looking to carve out a niche, uh, participate more in ethics at their institution, um, or maybe transition altogether. 
but but we've we've had students on um, coming right out of college um, and and students who are already are retired health professionals um, and and it's an interesting mix we definitely skew toward the tr traditional student but we have plenty of not so-called non-traditional students as well I would add too that dental ethics is a very interesting um, area under bioethics. I actually um, give a monthly lecture um, or talk on dental, different dental ethics topics once a month yes. at Metro Health um, Medical Center for the dental residents there. So there is definitely um, a need for ethics within um, the dentistry world. It's a, and it's an area that's going to open up. So if you're, if you're pursuing it now, your timing is good. <laughs> There's also a question, how are the clinicals affected by COVID-19? Okay, great question. Um, the clinical, so what we had to do is we had to cut short our clinicals in the second semester. Um, as I'm sure is true, I mean, it was true even of, of people who were in medical school and nursing school, right? Um, however, our various sites are now moving back, they're setting schedules for accepting students. We don't know when our students, our bioethics students, will be allowed back in the clinical setting, but we are looking at, um, what is it now, Leah, June, July, for med students to be going back into clinical settings. It, because Cleveland, Northeast Ohio did a really good job. Um, the state leadership was excellent. Um, in moving quickly to flatten the curve. And fortunately, and let's hope it, it, this, this is borne out in the coming months, but fortunately we've avoided the worst of COVID-19 so far. It's still awful, but we've avoided the worst. And uh, we, we think that we have the safety, the precautions in place to have Health, uh, uh, health professionals in training, so med students, nursing students, PA students, and eventually bioethics students, um, and medical humanities back into clinical settings. So we hope that by fall, uh, our students will be back into clinical settings. And it's possible late summer, some of our students who are doing a summer rotation, some of our uh, dual degree students will do a, a summer clinical rotation we're hoping that maybe mid-July and August we'll actually have rotations open again, but we don't know. I would say too that there, there is the off chance that some specific uh, clinical rotation opportunities may not be available. Um, uh, you know, they may say, you know, we can go back to the hospital, but you can't go to this ICU because yeah. That's where the COVID patients the are. COVID located. ICU, you're probably not going to go. <laughs> or, or even if the medical ICU or trauma ICU is connected to the COVID uh, unit, you may not be um, allowed there. But yeah, we're, we're hoping to do some preliminary rotations this late summer um, and then hopefully be good to go in the fall. But we have to wait and see. So, so a typical week, Wesley asks, it would be something like this. Um, you'll have your core seminar on Tuesday and Thursday uh, early evening, so 5.30 to, 7, uh, 5.30 to 8, uh, something like that, right, give or take a half hour. Um, you would have a couple of elective classes that are three credit hours classes, so those might meet in the middle of the afternoon on, one might meet for two hours in the afternoon on a Wednesday, another might meet for two hours um, on, a, on a Monday. Um, you would fit in your clinical rotations, your observation opportunities based on what your schedule looked like. You would have a weekly preceptor meeting based on your clinical observations. So something I didn't mention about the rotations is you have preceptors at each site so whichever acute care hospital it is, and you meet weekly with the other students in the preceptor, uh, the other students who are rotating at the site, and you um, uh, discuss what you've seen, the ethical and legal dimensions of what you've seen that week. 
Um, so, so that would be part of your week as well. And then you attend a, uh, depending on whether you're in the research ethics concentration or the medicine society and culture or the traditional bioethics, you would attend um, a, a talk or a journal club or whatever once a week. Uh, so, so you we'll keep you busy, but you're going to get a master's degree in two semesters. You're going to work. You're going to stay busy. We're going to keep you engaged. Um, we also have other activities like uh, works in progress. We actually had a virtual one today that was led by Max Melman, who is a really well-known uh, health law and bioethics person who heads up the health law program at Case. Um, he did... Um, uh, a military ethics presentation on um, predictive genetic testing on military, um, uh, members of the military. <laughs> really interesting ethical issues there. Um, okay, uh, Malika, I hope I'm saying it right. Um, US visa, you know, okay, we allow this but it's very case specific. So, so off webinar, let's, let's try to address that for you, okay? Um, we have allowed students to start the second semester. It's suboptimal, but it's doable. So, so the answer is probably, okay? Anything else? Yes, you have to have an undergraduate degree. That was anonymous attendee asking. The tuition, uh, it's the graduate tu tuition of case. So it is, I don't know what the exact number is, but it's around. I think it's 40, around 47. About $47,000 which is, we you know, a lot. Um, we keep in mind though, it's a one-year program. And there are plenty of master's degree programs out there that are two years, and you're gonna end up spending that much or more, and you're also gonna spend two years of your life. We have been adamant that we will keep this a one-year program. We pack it all in because my God, you know, higher education, We've got to do something about its cost in this country, but that's a whole other discussion. So Slides I think we have a question about, email. yeah, so we're gonna, we'll send out a copy of this recording and we'll also send a copy of the slides out um, to everyone who both registered and attended. Excellent. Any final questions? You know, thanks, thanks for um, logging on and participating. We, we really appreciate it. And what I want you to know for sure is if you end up applying and you're accepted and you decide to come, however, the, whatever the delivery mechanism is, we will make sure that you get a good education and that you're engaged. Oh, we have one more question, okay. We have direct patient contact. Um, there's opportunity to shadow physicians based on particular physician willingness. Where we've had the biggest success is in, in the emergency department, which is really interesting, uh, at Metro. Um, and we've actually had students spend an evening with a physician on the weekend uh, overnight. Um, at the ED. But that is a very specific thing because we need a willing physician um, to have you along. But we're, we're pretty good about um, finding that. Um, letter of recommendations three. Um, yeah, so this is a pain. Um, the the there are some privacy we we don't this is not our rule this is more amcs if if you get authorization to send those letters to us um vishal 
Um, we will accept them. But the problem is, is we are not allowed to access those ourselves. And there are uh, services, and AMCAS might be one of them, that um, are uncomfortable having letters go to a program uh, that is different uh, in kind than the one that the letters were written for, right? So if you're applying to medical school, um, there's some discomfort in having those letters go to a bioethics program or another type of program. Um, we, we on our side have some latitude with what we'll accept, okay? I will say that if anyone has specific questions about their application, their yes. letters of recommendation, their situation, please email us at bioethics at case.edu. Um, we either can answer you via email or we can set up a, a phone call or a Zoom meeting to do a one-on-one yes. -on -one, um, to specifically answer your questions for your situation. We, and, we, and we will definitely do that. All right, guys, thanks a lot. It's, 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 it's weird, this virtual webinar. I'm getting more and more used to it, of course, with all the Zoom meetings. Um, and now I'm wondering, why don't we see you? Um, maybe we'll do a Zoom one of these uh, with, with uh, video at, at the next time. But, but thanks for joining. Um, oh yeah, it's right here. It should be on the screen still. Bioethics at case. Dot edu. Got it? All right. Thank you, everybody, so much, and have a good rest of your day. All right. Bye.